Signore e signori, buonasera. Welcome to Casa Italiana, Zerili Marimmo at New York University for our contribution to this year's edition of the Giornata della Memoria, the International Holocaust Memorial Day. Uh, as you know, it's one of the occasions, and I would say maybe the occasion, in which all the Italian cultural institutions in New York gather and decide a program. It's not easy, it's a very complicated thing, uh, but I like the idea that if we have to choose one event, one program, it's the one dedicated to the Giornata della Memoria. I believe and I hope it says something about the duty that Italy feels uh, of carrying on this memory. And the fact that different institutions, from the ones that do visual arts to the ones that do more literature to the one about Italian-Americans, we are all together. And I, I have to congratulate my colleagues at the Centro Primo Levi because they are the soul of all these things. So every institution presents a program, a proposal, but the coordination that, so that all these different events, there is one left, so you're welcome to pick this up upstairs, that all these events make sense together in the way in which they are, and there is a sense, and I assure you, is really the merit of our colleagues at the Centro Primo Levi, and Natalia Andrimi and Alessandro Cassini, that I think for their energy, not only in promoting their own work, but in helping us working together. Thank you. Um, this evening is a very special evening. We're going to talk about Fiume. Uh, how many of you have heard about Fiume or know what Fiume is? Bravi. Menos, less than 10 people. So whereas Fiume is really a stumbling block in Italian history, and every Italian knows what Fiume is, or what Fiume used to be, because it's no longer Fiume, it has another name. Uh, and the different events that develop around that, that part of Italy that is now no longer Italy, and the adventures that this part of uh, Croatia now uh, underwent. But very few people, even in Italy, where the name is a staple, and it's between myth and legend, and our historian here is going to probably tell us something about how the myth and the legend very often interferes with history. Um, even in Italy, where the name is very well known, obviously associated to the enterprise of Gabriele D'Annunzio, very few people have an idea, a clear idea of the line of the event, how they developed, how things really were in Fiume before and after that event. So, and especially regarding the topics we are discussing tonight, the treatment of the uh, Jewish population in Fiume that was by vocation Fiume, a very international, very multicultural city, a city where you would also almost have the impression of being immune from all that could happen in the world because it was this ideal place where different cultures coexisted they never had problems so there are myths and there are legends about fiume some of them fascinating some of them a bit eerie uh, and i think it's very important that tonight we take advantage of the presence of an historian that specializes and that wrote a book about about fiume and its uh, history and the witnesses the memoirs the written memories of people that originated from Fiume uh, were victims of the Holocaust with their families and survived to tell the story. And we have the daughter uh, of the daughters of two of these witnesses. So in the second part of the program, after um, we'll have the historical introduction, historical presentation, it's going to be the moment to give voice to the witnesses. So we're going to have a couple of our actresses that are going to read from these memoirs, and then we are going to have the possibility, and you're also involved, to ask questions to the witnesses that are here with us. So this combination of historians, direct witnesses, the family of the, of the, of the survivors that also play a very important role is the, the center and the focus of this event. Um, so we start with uh, Dominic Kirchner, who specializes in modern European history at the Habsburg Empire, Italy, the Balkans, migration and nationalism. Before uh, come, going to Miami, she taught here at New York University. So it's a welcome back. Thank you. Very good. If you want to come, and then immediately after, Natalia Indrimi, who is the director of the Centro Primo Levi, will take over and she will conduct the second part with the witnesses. Professor, please. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. My name is Dominique Ryle. It's such a pleasure to be here on this day, especially. And I am just going to give a short 
backdrop to the testimonies that we're going to hear and the, the thinking about the experience of the Holocaust in Fiume. So this is a, a short lecture about how and why Fiume became Italy's Holocaust city. Uh, anyone who studies Gabriele D'Annunzio, who we just heard about, has heard Fiume described as the Holocaust city. But they don't talk about Holocaust the way we think about Holocaust. This was a term that was used before the Holocaust happened, and it was about ideology. When D'Annunzio wrote these words, il nome giusto della città non è fiume ma holocausto, perfettamente consumato dal fuoco tutta, what he was talking about was human beings that he thought cared so much about being Italian that they would be willing to sacrifice everything, that they would be willing to risk starvation, that they would be willing to lose their homes, that they cared more about being Italian than about their domesticity. This is a myth. This is not true. Some people did, but the city, all of it, did not feel this way. Many people also weren't Italian. But this idea of Holocaust existed in the 1910s and the 1920s and the 1930s when talking about Fiume, and it was associated with Italian nationalism, not with anti-Semitism. In fact, many of the people who collaborated with D'Annunzio while he was there in 1919 and 1920 were of Jewish heritage. It had absolutely, that word did not have anything to do with the extermination of people of the Jewish faith or related to people of the Jewish faith. It yeah. had to do with ideology. This makes it very difficult for historians when thinking about the Holocaust and Fiume because of the same word meaning such different things. It also is very difficult because so much of the history of Fiume, as we just heard, is linked to Italian nationalism and this idea of proto-fascism. So many of the stories we're going to hear today are going to be of surprise, of angered surprise, of a feeling of betrayal because people's homes were now being made not their homes. Neighbors were letting neighbors die. Neighbors were letting neighbors being taken away. There was no feeling that this would happen. There was a feeling that there would, might be violence around nationalism, but in Fiume before 1938, there was not a feeling that there would be violence around anti-Semitism. So what my lecture is about today is how did a history that assumed it was going to be around nationalism become a history that was about anti-Semitism? First things first, some of you already know this, but I just want to make sure we know what we're talking about here. Where in the world is Fiume? As, as we just heard, there is no Fiume anymore. It's called Rieca. Rieca means river. Fiume means river. Strangely enough, this town does not have an important river. Its river's name is Little River. <laughs> but this is a picture of, the, of today's Rieca. And Fiume is not the entire city of Rieca. Fiume is everything west of the river that is the old town. The eastern of the river is called Sushak. It used to be a different city. It was in a different country. It's kind of, uh, it's, 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 it's a city like Brooklyn and Manhattan. They, they are, a, a river divides them. They used to be two different municipalities and now they have been joined as one. But in the 19th century and in the 20th century, all the way through the Holocaust, they were not one, they were two. And that kind of difference was important. Different citizenships, different laws, different taxes, different ports. So Fiume is this. Sushak is this. And, that, and, the, and you can see the big port over there. This, um, some little things that people don't know. Fiume was not part of Italy until fascism. So in the 19th century, after the Napoleonic Wars and after the revolutions of 1848, Fiume was part of the kingdom of Croatia, Slavonia, that was part of the kingdom of Hungary, that was part of the Habsburg Empire. This is a picture of Fiume in around the 1850s. From 1868 to 1918, Fiume was made kind of a 
modern day Hong Kong. It was a semi-independent city-state within the Kingdom of Hungary. It was under no other state. Its two official languages were Italian and Hungarian. It was illegal to teach Croatian in the schools, though many people also spoke Croatian. It was, gear it was geared this way to become a hub of commerce and transport to attract people to invest their lives in this Hong Kong on the Adriatic. It was conceived of as a place in competition with Trieste, which was Austria's port on the Adriatic. Fiume was going to be Hungary's port on the Adriatic. Over 40% of the populace in Fiume identified as mother tongue Italian when forced to choose a language. Many of those people also spoke other languages. Many of the people, almost 30% who said Croatian, 10% who said Hungarian, 5% who said German, and then all the others, also spoke Italian. It was a, a city of multilingualism, as we just heard, but of a predominance of Italian speakers, and thanks to these language practices, connections across the Mediterranean, not just with the Italian peninsula, but with all of the areas where Italian was considered a language of networking and trade. Fiume was Hungarian, but strangely Italian, and people moving there came precisely because of all these graynesses, right? This is a place that was open to people moving there. It is considered a boom town from the 1880s to 1914. And here are some numbers. So in 1890, there were about 29,500 inhabitants. 10 years later, it is 32% more populous in just 10 years. 10 years after that, it's 27% bigger. Or if you look at it over two decades, 68% bigger. People are moving to Fiume from all over, from the Italian peninsula, from Central Europe, from the Balkans, from Egypt, from the Ottoman Empire. They're moving there because they think they can make their fortune there. Rich people are moving there to invest in industries and companies. Poor people are moving there to get a job. This is a boom town, not just in numbers, but in the idea of possibilities. And these are state-sponsored opportunities from the Hungarian state that again is trying to make a Hong Kong on the Adriatic. <clears throat> By 1914, only 30% of the people living in Fiume have this thing called Pettinenza, in German, Heimatrecht. What that means is something like local citizenship. The Habsburg Empire was an empire. It had two citizenships, Austrian and Hungarian. Under that, every, every commune, every city, municipality also had uh, something called pertinenza that was different than residenza, different than residency, and it allowed you social services if you were poor. Everybody who lived here, regardless of their citizenship or pertinenza, had access to the school system, had access to the hospitals, had, could work legally. It's very different than our system of citizenship in the United States. This openness towards people coming in, as long as they could pay their own rent, so the 30% who have pertinenza could get, become uh, in, uh, homeless and the city would take care of them. The 70% who moved there without Petinenza were allowed to stay and take advantage of the city as long as they could pay for themselves. Right? And it wasn't a problem because people were coming there for jobs and to make money. And so you have a situation until 1914 where you have people from all over who are living in the city legally but they don't have this little thing called Petinenza which gives you rights. Jews from all over Europe and the Mediterranean moved to Fiume just like everybody else who moved to Fiume. They were a very, very uh, active, uh, uh, in, in many different ways, rich, poor, and everything in between, uh, members of this city. They were very visible. This is the major road. Weiss is one of the richest uh, uh, traders in the city. There was never a vision that you had to hide 
your ancestry. You had your uh, names from all certain different kinds of ethnic legacies, and there were uh, several synagogues in and around Fiume. This was a multi-ethnic, multilingual place in which being of a different religion than Catholicism wasn't just legal, it was legally protected. Sushak, the eastern part of the river, also had an important Jewish community in it. It was, however, legally part of a different country. It was part of the kingdom of Croatia Slavonia, which was also in the Habsburg Empire. It's important to put those two stories together because during fascism, many, uh, many Jews took advantage of walking over the bridge to get out of some, some of the violence and fears that was going on. So always remember that that border between Fiume and Sushak, the right and the left side of the river, was, was an opportunity when you felt afraid or when there was violence being incorporated by the state. In October 1918, at the end of World War I, the Habsburg Empire just suddenly dissolved. No one knew it was going to happen then. And in this, within a 48-hour people period, four different associations proclaimed the new state. There was the Italian community that, that proclaimed themselves part of Italy. There was the Yugoslav community that pro proclaimed themselves part of Yugoslavia. There were the socialists that proclaimed Fiume part of the global international. <laughs> and there were these autonomous, these independent Fiume people who said, we are independent, <laughs> us against the world. In the end, when the Italian army arrived, they moved the, the Yugoslav committee to across the river to Sushak, and they installed the Italian uh, community. And so the, the local government of the town in its gray zone where no one knew where it belonged was the Italian uh, National Committee. The, the Yugoslav National Committee um, was put in charge of Sushak. Until, Nova, until September 1919, there was an inter-allied um, occupation of the city, British, American, French, Italian. And kind of like if you guys ever saw the Orson Welles movie, The Third Man, or if you've ever seen all those great movies about Berlin after World War II, you have this strange uh, collaboration, condominium of global armies in Fiume, trying to keep it up for grabs, trying to make sure no country can get it until the Treaty in Versailles is signed and, and the great powers have decided where it should go. In the meantime, even though those occupying forces were in charge, city administration was done by Fiumeans. So life actually didn't change that much. And it didn't change for Jews either. There's only two weeks that, you can, uh, that people have tracked real anti-Semitism in the local newspapers. And partially it's been explained because there were only two people in charge of the no local newspapers, and one of them for two weeks was an anti-Semite. But the city itself did not trans transition after World War II into a place of anti-Semitism. It felt very similar to how it had felt before. When Gabriele D'Annunzio came in in his red fiat on September 12, 1919, followed by two or 300,000 veterans and soldiers, he too did not change the city administration of the city. He took over where the inter-allied troops had left. And so Fiume kept on actually functioning very similarly to how it had before the war. And this is also important for thinking about Jewish inhabitants in the city. Life changed a lot. No one knew what was going to happen. It was scary. A lot of people thought they knew an answer. A lot of stuff was in the news. But in terms of daily life and thinking about fear and change and community and, and who are you in Fiume as a non-Catholic or non-Christian, it did not feel scary. It felt scary around if you were a Slavic speaker or an Italian speaker. It did not feel scary about who your grandparents were and if they went to a synagogue or if they went to a church. In, 19, in uh, August 1920, D'Annunzio kicked out the local government. Uh, they had decided that they wanted to uh, follow Woodrow Wilson's determination that few may be made an independent state. D'Annunzio said they don't know what they're talking about. It needs to be made part of Italy. And for a couple months, D'Annunzio took over the state and, and put in his own guys. 
they actually didn't change very much either. But we have this couple months, we have this Regenza del Canago, which is, uh, is, is highly studied by Italian historians. We can talk about that later. In December, at Christmas time, 1920, the Italian state tells Danuncio's Fiume, either accept the international treaty that makes you a independent city state, or we will attack you and force you to accept your independence. Danuncio basically said, bring it. And the Italians brought it and bombed the city. And a couple days later, they gave in and they accepted their independence. Danuncio was kicked out of the city. It's called the Natale, Natale di Sangue. From 1920, January 1921 until, until uh, 1924, Fiume was an independent city-state under the protection of the League of Nations and Italy. Citizens of, of, of Fiume were defined by that weird term I mentioned before, pertinency. So that Habsburg strange category became the right to Fiume citizenship between 1921 and 1924. If you didn't have that category and you, were, you felt like you were an Italian national, you could opt for Fiume citizenship, apply for it. Some people got it, some people didn't. There's a lot of things going on there, fascinating. Lots of people have written about this. We can't talk about it, we got stuff to do. <laughs> the city-state had a leader, Zanella, he's, he's now considered this kind of hero of this multinationalism and independent Fiume thing. It, uh, well, we don't need to talk about that. In 1924, there is a fascist coup, actually in 1922, and in 1924, a treaty is made between Mussolini's fascist state and the king, uh, Yugoslavia, in which Fiume is annexed to Italy. And this is important too. Anyone who had pertinency before 1919 was automatically made an Italian citizen. Anyone who was a Fiume citizen by 1924 was continued, continued, considered an Italian citizen. Non-Italian citizens were allowed to continue living in Fiume. So, when the fascist state took on Fiume, they took on many non-Italians who partially did get Italian citizenship because of those Habsburg papers. I know this sounds really, you know, maybe too detail-oriented, but this is why Fiume becomes Italy's Holocaust city. So, this is what I just said, we don't need to talk about that. What happens with the racial laws in 1938 is they redefine Italian citizenship. And they base it on 1919. Anyone who is not an Italian citizen before 1919 is considered a foreigner. Which means protections, and we don't need to talk about that, Oh, if you want to, we can, this is a book I wrote. If you're interested in the period before 1921, I have a lot to say. There's a lot of fun stories. What happens is the Habsburg states bureaucracy around citizenship and rights becomes the legal method the Italian state uses to denationalize Fiume Jews. This is partially why some of Fiume's most famous Jewish writers and statesmen have written about the legacy of the Habsburg Empire. Le Leo Valiani is so famous, not for, just because of the res uh, resistance, not just because of how important he was for I Italy politically, but also he wrote one of the best histories of the dissolution of the Habsburg monarchy in part because the dissolution of the Habsburg monarchy set up the tragedy that was the Holocaust in Fiume. Why? And if this is what I was mentioning before. Here. Where is it? Here. Denial. Anyone who did not have pertinency or citizenship, Italian so Trieste is safe. This is a different story. Trieste is already absorbed into Italy by now. 
Anyone who does not have Italian citizenship or Fiume pertinency by January 1919 is not considered Italian anymore, even if they had an Italian passport, which means Italian Jews from Fiume who didn't have the right Habsburg documentation now are much more vulnerable and face being kicked out of the city, having absolutely no rights whatsoever. From going that Fiume is your home, in a second, Fiume is a foreign city to you. The best book on this came out a couple of years ago and unfortunately has not been translated into either English or Italian, which I think is a travesty. It's by a woman who's from the area. Um, it was paid for by the Holocaust Center in Zagreb. It is absolutely superb. If you are interested in this, you can copy and paste and put it in Google Translate, but she has done a detailed analysis of everything that happened, as you can see from Actually, the first part of the book is from the 1860s all the way until the Holocaust. It's absolutely fabulous. But she shows us through, through uh, such beautiful research how people got made foreigners in their own land and how the violence started from day one, how the vulnerability started from day one. Something that a lot of our testimonies are hard to get at because so many of the children of the Holocaust don't know what pertinency is. Their grandparents knew what that was, and maybe their parents. So it, it, it's something that we can get at differently. This is her. I've never met her. She's not my friend. I am not promoting her book for anything, but I think it's really good. And she has in it, at the end, she has a summary in English where she basically says, as you can see here, that this is, this is the Habsburg uh, bureaucratic legacy story that gets manipulated by the, the fascist state in order to de make more Jews not Italians. This was all the setup for the more important thing that we're doing today, which is to think about the experience of being uh, in the Holocaust in Fiume. I hope any, this was useful for thinking about what it felt like, because sometimes structures can be so cruel and they create the emotions we have, but it's only through thinking about the lived experience that we know to care about structures as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dominique. This was a very important presentation. It tells us a lot about how the legal, the juridic structure of our countries today can or cannot, can determine or prevent uh, tragedies. And um, yes, indeed, the situation of Fiume Jews was one of the most brutal and cruel. It, Jews were denationalized all over Italy if had they had not obtained Italian citizenship before 1919. But in Fiume, the entire community was denationalized overnight, which didn't leave anyone to help. Substantially, it was an entire community left isolated and alone. And many of these all the memoirs we have, uh, I should say, Shintopoulos Levy has collected many, many memoirs of uh, Jews from Fiume, and everybody remembers those uh, the, that moment in which everything was lost, in which they could not operate in the city anymore. So I'd like to say uh, just a couple of things before we start our readings. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge a few people here. Uh, Lisa Lager, who is the niece of Kathy Lager and also her daughter, Kathy's daughters are following us online, uh, Marsha and Sandra from Italy. Um, Orly Artum, uh, who is uh, somewhere here, here she is. She's the granddaughter of Rabbi Deutsch, uh, one of the of four rabbis in Fiume. They were, all the rabbis in Fiume were killed in different circumstances. Uh, Rabbi Deutsch was a fighter of the resistance and uh, a wonderful man, so we have been in touch for many years so through the research and personally. And also Anne Goldstein, who translated beautifully the book uh, by uh, Tatiana and Andra Bucci that we are going to read now. I'll say just a few words about, um, about their story. Um, they were born in Fiume, 
uh, to Mira Perlo, uh, originally from Belarus, and Giovanni Bucci, who was from, uh, from Fiume, was a, um, a Fiume man, he was a Catholic. Giovanni was a cook and worked on merchant ships, and so he was often, often traveling. Uh, as we said, signs of intolerance in Fiume began very early with, when the Italians arrived. We should also say that the Jewish community started as soon as um, the Italians took over, the, the numbers of Jews began to diminish very, fast, very quickly. And uh, the, the real aggression was initially against the Slavs. It was the, the first experiment of ethnic cleansing uh, by the fascist regime. And Mira and the girls, Mira understood that uh, it was uh, more prudent to convert. So the three women convert to the, the girl and, and, and Mira convert to Catholicism. In 1940, Giovanni was uh, stationed on some ship in South Africa, Italy entered the war, is captured by the British and he remains in a South African prison until 45, uh, while Mira and her entire family and the girls are uh, arrested in Fiume and deported to Auschwitz. Um, against all odds, these two girls survived, and, um, and their mom survived, and they were all united. I don't think there are many, many stories of this kind. And um, they wrote a book that I recommend to, it's called the Always Remember Your Name, is published by Astra House, and um, it's, a true example of how people can remember themselves as children. And um, Andra will tell us a little, I think, a little bit more um, after the reading. I would like to invite to the podium um, uh, Ali Alice Luciana Parente, who will uh, read uh, the text. Am, am I correct or I switched? Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, Carlotta Brenton will, uh, will um, read uh, an excerpt from the book by uh, Andre Tatiana. Thank you very much. Please uh, welcome Carlotta. A story that comes from far away, from Russia to Fiume. Ours is a long story, and it begins far away. Our father, Giovanni Bucci, was born in Fiume into a Catholic family of Istrian origin. He met our mother, Mira Perlo, in Fiume in 1928. They fell in love and seven years later married. Mira, born in 1908 into a Jewish family, had arrived in Fiume as a child with her parents, Moisa and Rosa Perlo, our adored Nonna Rosa, whom we grew up with until Auschwitz tore her from us. Nonna Rosa was born in 1883 into a family, the Farberos, who were then living in Vidrinka, a town on the border between Ukraine and Russia. According to her passport, which included her children, at the time of her birth and that of her children, Vidrinka belonged to Russia. When she was a child, Russian, along with Yiddish, obviously, was the language spoken at home. Around 1910, we don't know the exact year, Nonna, who had married Moisa Perlo, left Vidrinka with her new family, almost certainly because of one of the many pogroms against the Jews that were raging throughout Eastern Europe at the time. Thus began a long period of wandering over the continent, a complicated journey that meant crossing borders and nations, passing through frontiers and peoples often hostile to Jews. This was the Europe in the early 20th century, not long before the First World War broke out. The family traveled on horse-drawn carts, several generations together. Our great-grandparents, Lazzaro and Lea Farbero, whose remains we found years ago in the Jewish cemetery in Fiume, and their children, Nonna Rosa with her husband, Moisa Perlo, our great-aunt Rebecca with her husband, Salomon Plotkin, the Farberos' four other children, and a crowd of grandchildren and cousins. This large group stopped for a short period in Hungary, where some relatives of Moisa Perlo owned or managed a candy factory. But it was a brief stop. Almost immediately, the caravan decided to keep going. 
perhaps thinking that they might someday reach Palestine, perhaps simply looking for new opportunities. Eventually, they reached Fiume, where they decided to stay, because it was a city on the sea, or so we were always told by our aunt Gisella, our mother's sister, who, although she was a child at the time, remembered those days. It was an interminable journey, she said. So the Perlos arrived in Fiume from Russia before the Great War altered the map of the old continent, changing borders, affiliations, empires. Here, as often happened in those years, our family split up for the first time. The Plotkins continued on from Fiume to America, Uncle Salomon first, followed by his wife and children. They went to New York to seek their fortune, but after the war, with the death of Nonna Rosa and then of our aunts, we lost contact with our American relatives. We found them again, somewhat by chance, several years ago, when Andra's daughter Sonia was trying through the internet to reconstruct our family tree. At that point, American descendants of the Plotkins got in touch with her, writing, you know that we may be related? Of the six Farbera siblings who left Russia, only our grandparents decided to stay in Fiume. All the others went to America. Nonna Rosa decided instead to bring up her children in Fiume with help from the city's Jewish community and with what she periodically received from the American relatives. And she had a respectable life, if without luxuries. It's important to remember that until 1919, Fiume was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and that after a brief interregnum at the end of the First World War, it was Italian from 1924 to 1945. That's why we, who were born in the late 30s, felt and have always felt Italian. To a certain degree, our life is intertwined with the end of great European empires. Nanna was very, very religious. She went to synagogue until the very last day, in January 1944, when the Nazis set fire to the building. But it wasn't a problem to be religious in Fiume. The Austro-Hungarian Empire certainly had many flaws, but it also had this distinctive characteristic. It didn't change your surname. It didn't oblige you to marry a faith. All were free to profess their own creed. Catholics, Jews, Muslims, Orthodox, and Protestants grew up together. The resentments and barriers or discriminations that always exist between people, because unfortunately they have always existed, were never sanctioned by the authorities. Rather, the contrary was true. It's a significant fact, and it allowed our grandmother to bring up her children in freedom. We think this was the reason that in the end, the family chose Fiume as their home. One breathed a different air, the exact opposite of what the Farberos and Perlos had left behind. A long wake of fears, persecutions, and flights in search of peace and safety. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was sustained by a particular environment, the Mittel Europa of the early 20th century, where our family, in spite of everything, including the many flaws and limitations of the system, could feel free. The culture in which Mira grew up was passed on to us as well, our mother instilled in us the principles of tolerance and respect, teaching us to see events and our own lives with an open-minded perspective. And she continued to encourage these principles even with what we suffered during the Nazi persecutions. It was an extremely important lesson which helped form our characters and make us what we are today, Italian, but also citizens of the world. In the house in Fiume, Nonna Rosa lived with her six children, Sonia, Gisella, Aaron, Mira, our mother, Paola, and Giuseppe, Uncle Jossi, born between 1902 and Sonia, and 1913, Uncle Jossi, the only one born in Fiume. They all, grew they all grew up like ordinary people with ordinary aspirations, desires, uncertainties, and contradictions. Uncle Aaron, for instance, was very devout, unlike our mother, who was much less so and went to synagogue only on necessary holidays or when Nanna asked her to. The entire family, except our mother and Aunt Gisella, was murdered by the Nazis. As we mentioned, our father and mother met in 1928. 
Giovanni, called Nino, was born in Fiume on June 24, 1906, and was therefore two years older than her. Papa was an extraordinary person. He was handsome and good, a very good man. His family had Istrian roots, and his surname was originally Bucic, Italianized after 1938 to Bucci, in another of those intersections and overlaps of history that have marked our family. His mother, our paternal grandmother, was named Maria Salomon. She was Catholic, but she too probably had some remote Jewish roots. Nanna Maria ran a restaurant, and partly for that reason, our father learned to cook early. We never knew her husband, Nonno Tommaso. He was a sailor who died on a ship transporting wood in the Strait of Messina when Nonna was pregnant with their third child. Papa had a brother who was an electrician, and a sister, Aunt Antoinetta, called Tonchi, born around 1919, whom we were close to for a long time. So Nonna Maria was Catholic and very observ observant. And maybe partly for that reason, she wasn't terribly fond of us. She never accepted the marriage between Papa and Mama, a Jewish woman joining the family. And she showed it on many occasions. Our parents met under the clock tower in Fiume, the way young people did in those days, and as perhaps they still do today. They were engaged for seven years before they got married. Papa worked in a pastry shop and played soccer for the Fiumana team and for the national military team. He always said he should have gone to play for Bologna, which at the time was one of the most important teams in Italy. But life carried him elsewhere. He began going to sea, embarking as a cook. He loved ships, and he loved the sea deeply. Even in the last years of his life, when he had retired, he would usually go out to the balcony as soon as he woke up to look at the sea. It was the first thing he did. For many years, he worked on ships belonging to Lloyds of Trieste in the Merchant Marine. In 1940, when Italy entered the conflict, he was sailing off South Africa. His ship, the Timavo, was sunk by its commander to keep it from being requisitioned by the British. Even though Papa wasn't a soldier, he was taken with the other Italians to Coffiefontaine, a prison camp near Johannesburg. He stayed there until 1945. The family and the racial laws. We have some clear memories of our early childhood in Fiume, and some that are less distinct. Naturally, Mamma and Aunt Gisella told us many things later. If we think back now, we return, in memory, immediately to our house, on the ground floor at Via Milano 15. We are inside, in a long hallway off which various rooms opened. We all lived there together, the two of us, Mamma, Papa when he wasn't at sea, Nonna Rosa, Uncle Jossi, and our cousin Mario, and Sonia's son, who was about 10 years older than us. He was born in 1928, and when our aunt moved to Trieste for work, he stayed and lived with Nonna Rosa. In Fiume, our mother had become a seamstress, Aunt Gisella a milliner, and Uncle Jossi a barber. Mamma was very close to our aunt, who in 1937 married Eduardo de Simone. They too had met in Fiume. Following her husband, a sailor like Papa, to his various posts, Aunt Gisella moved to Naples, where the same year our cousin Sergio was born. Nonna Rosa attended synagogue regularly and was a dedicated member of the community. But that didn't make her narrow-minded or less open to the world. On the contrary, she was a very intelligent woman. And although she was devout, unlike our grandmother Maria, she accepted the marriages of her daughters Mira and Gisella to Catholics. We had a normal life at least until 1938, when things concerning our family began to change rapidly. First, the racial laws, then the war and the deportations transformed everything forever. The first indication that something was changing was in fact the Italianization of our surname. Papa was summoned by his captain who told him he had to change Bucic to Bucci or he wouldn't be able to go to sea anymore. It was the first 
immediate consequence of the politics of the Italianization of Istria imposed by the fascist regime. In addition, he was asked to join the fascist party. That was the limit for him. A socialist forced to support the fascio. Later, he called himself a Nenniano, a follower of the socialist politician Pietro Nenni. But like many others, he couldn't refuse. He had a family to support. It was the sign of no return. The second hint of the changing times was that Mamma was baptized as an antidote to the imminent promulgation of the racial laws. Italy was suddenly becoming an unfriendly country. Thank you so much, Carlotta. This was a beautiful reading. Um, shall we connect for a few minutes to Andre Tatiana Bucci? How do we do this? Sorry, I'm not okay. Ciao, Andrea. Ciao. Mi senti? Immagino che Tatiana sia andata a dormire. Sì, era un po' stanca. Ok. Uh, so si è addormentata, si è, prima si era addormentata davanti alla televisione e allora io le ho detto vai a letto. So we have only one connection in California because from Brussels it was too late. Tatiana abbiamo letto queste bellissime pagine che raccontano un pochino l'inizio, com'era la vostra famiglia a fiume e sappiamo che abbiamo poco tempo, che, un, eh, che poi presenteremo il libro qui in autunno, ma volevo chiederti appunto di dire al nostro pubblico qualcosa sulla, su come tu e Tatiana avete deciso di scrivere questo libro e cosa, eh, cosa, cosa possiamo fare oggi, cosa, a questa memoria a cosa serve oggi, a cosa, cosa ci possiamo fare oggi. <coughs> Allora, da te ed io pensavamo già da, da anni, si parlava di scrivere il nostro, un libro sulla nostra storia, perché la nostra storia è particolare, ha un lieto fine. Give me one eh. so, uh, I, Tatiana and I have been thinking about reading this book for a long time because it is, our story is is particular in the fact that it has a happy ending. Siamo stati certamente arrestati in 13, però siamo stati anche fortunati perché su 13 siamo tornati a casa in 4, che è una media anche buona. We were arrested. E quindi volevamo Scusa. 13 of us were arrested and we came back in 4 and for what this was it it's more than in many more than have, you know, other families uh, suffered. Penso che non ci sia una storia di due bambine sopravvissute che sono tornate due figlie, soltanto mia mamma e papà eravamo solo in due e quindi due due sono tornate, ma hanno avuto anche la fortuna di di ritrovare in, abbiamo avuto la fortuna di ritrovare i nostri genitori, quindi veramente una, un happy ending, come hai detto tu prima. That um, we were just two daughters in, in, in our family of four, and uh, um, it is very, it was, uh, it was uh, unforeseeable and, and, and very, very lucky that our parents and us returned. E, e quindi era, era giusto farla sapere, con, far conoscere anche eh, agli altri, non che rimanesse soltanto una nostra storia di famiglia. Eh, trovo è stato bellissimo poi il sapere che il nostro libro è stato tradotto in inglese, quindi ha dato l'opportunità anche a tante altre gente di conoscere. In fondo la, gli americani eh, sanno poco. Eh, della storia degli italiani ebrei. We wanted other people to learn about our story and share it. 
And um, also, we were happy to know that it was translated in America because uh, um, so little is known about Jews in Italy outside of, of, um, of Italy. Pensando sempre che siccome l'Italia Mussolini era alleato di Hitler, non sono stati toccati. Eh, ma purtroppo non è stato così. Eh, People generally think that uh, um, Italian Jews were not touched by the Holocaust, but obviously it was not so. Era giusto, era giusto. Era forse il momento, forse avremmo potuto scriverlo un po' prima, però trovo che sia forse arrivato il momento giusto, ecco. In un momento in cui uh, eh, sembra che poi il mondo, l'umanità abbia la memoria corta. It, even though we could have written it before, but this was the right time in the end. And it's a time when we feel that humanity has a short memory and is not con tutto quello che succede, eh, tutti gli immigranti in Europa che attraversano il mare, molti ci rimangono, la guerra tra l'Ucraina e la Russia, una guerra che sinceramente io penso un po' tutto il mondo, ma eh, mai me la sarei aspettata, proprio mai. E non riesco a capire perché la gente non riesca a, ad accettarsi un con l'altro. We see migrants crossing the, the seas and uh, uh, often dying and not being accept, accepted where they arrive. And this war in the, in the Ukraine, which I really cannot understand, and I can't understand why people cannot accept one another. E quello che voglio dire è che mi hai chiesto cosa posso suggerire, penso che sia molto difficile. Non c'è modo di, di far capire uh, che siamo tutti uguali e che dobbiamo comunque, cioè viviamo tutti insieme, perché non andare d'accordo, perché non accettarsi uno con l'altro. Cos'è che ho io di diverso? Perché sono ebrea rispetto a un cattolico, o, o un bianco, o un nero, siamo... Tutti uguali, assolutamente tutti uguali. Yeah, e so quindi good. non riesco proprio a, a capire perché eh, non si voglia proprio, non si riesce a far, uno non riesce a farsi accettare. Ecco, c'è sempre qualcuno che, che ti, ti stuzzica in qualche maniera, che ti, la parte cattiva di noi stessi viene fuori, ecco. It is so difficult to, uh, to understand, for people to understand that we are all the same. And I'm, I'm reversing her, um, what she said, and that um, the, the worst part of us often comes to surface. And it's so difficult for people to coexist and see each person uh, for what they are and accept them. And Andrea... <laughs> In, in quello che tu se continua no io volevo dire che quando con, con mia sorella facciamo tanti incontri in italia con le scuole facciamo anche i viaggi ad auschwitz per raccontare la nostra storia ma la storia noi rappresentiamo un po tutti i, i sopravvissuti perché io sono la più giovane italiana tornata a casa e e, e quindi siamo oramai soltanto noi due che facciamo i viaggi sino a Auschwitz Birkenau. I'm uh, we're the young um, we're the youngest um survivors who came back and um at this point there are very few people who can speak to the students and to the schools and we are the my sister and I are the only two people who accompany the schools um to in on the trips to Auschwitz. E noi lo diciamo sempre ai ragazzi perché facciamo i viaggi con studenti italiani eh, e lo diciamo sempre o anche quando andiamo nelle scuole a, a parlare eh, il mio suggerimento è di usare sempre la propria testa di, non far, di cercare di non farsi influenzare poi eh, è sempre difficile 
però non, non c'è una medicina. To the, to the students uh, to think with their own head. I only encourage students to think with their own head and not let others influence them. But of course, this is always very difficult. Andrea, thank you so much. Sì. Grazie tanto. Ti vogliamo ringraziare per aver partecipato. Ti aspettiamo qui per con Tatiana per presentare il libro. Grazie, grazie. Sarà molto bello venire a New York. E ti voglio dire, voglio ringraziare Anne Goldstein che è qui e Anne ha tradotto eh. il suo libro e è veramente molto bello, grazie molto. Grazie, grazie anche a voi. Ciao, ciao. E che, che mi avete fatto conoscere anche qualcosa di fiume che proprio non sapevo. <ride> Beh, parleremo molto di fiume. Sì, grazie. Ciao. Ciao. Dove vado adesso, Julian? I don't know what to do. I don't know. Vorrei che Julian venisse per... Um... Puoi continuare, puoi procedere col programma, nulla. non devi fare okay, niente. So we'll, pass, uh, we'll go to our second reading. Um, it's, uh, this is from a, another memoir, a book that was published only in Portuguese. Uh, by Nora Tao Tsunai. Uh, Nora was born in Fiume in 1924 to Eduardo Tao. And this is a slightly different story because the Tao's family has been, was living, had lived in Fiume for 500 years. So, so it was a very deeply rooted family. And uh, Yolanda Kapolnai, who was from Hungary. And uh, the, so the Tao, uh, I'll say just very briefly something about their story. So they were living in the city. Eduardo was uh, the head of an insurance company, of a national insurance company. Um, Yolanda was an interpreter for a, a timber company. And they um, had two kids, Nora and Giorgio. Um, they did well in Fiume, and also they had business and family in Budapest. So and like many Jewish families, they grew up, the kids grew up between Budapest and Fiume. It, traveling was very, very common. Was, was, uh, you'll find in all the memoirs of these families, there is always, you know, go to Romania, visit the aunt, visit the uncle, having some partner, business partner in one of the um, uh, bordering countries or area, regions. You can't even, you know, it was all, you know, in, in, their, in their views, they were in the Austro-Hungarian region. Uh, as Dominique said, I mean, the, what stayed in, the, in people's mind was the Austro-Hungarian uh, setting. Um, when the racial laws came, the Taos were also denationalized, even though they probably had tons of the pertinence paper, um, and they immediately understood they had to leave. They tried to get visas. It was very expensive. They had to pay the affidavit themselves, uh, um, intermediators uh, with various entities, including the Vatican, charged lots of money. They just didn't have the means. And uh, so they ended up, after trying many visas, they ended up staying. In, in June 1940, Italy enters the war, and all the Jews, the Jewish men of Fiume, no matter the age, um, whether sick or elderly, were brutally arrested or in very, you know, with a very efficient operation. Uh, Eduardo is arrested. Giorgio, who was not 18, managed to escape, but he's arrested a few days later on the street. Uh, they're uh, locked up at the Torretta, which is a local concentration camp. Uh, in 1940, the fascist regime creates all these concentration camps in, in near every Italian city and then larger concentration camps in the south. Um, they have a friend who is a, a senator and he, take, he gets them out. And at this point, they begin um, a life of you know, of an unstable life, trying to get visas 
and uh, um, trying to get by without any work because Eduardo had been fired, the kids were out of school, um, and uh, they do, you know, they're very creative in, uh, and, and resourceful, um, but life is hard until they managed to get a visa to Brazil. Brazil was somewhat th the last resort, that it was the country where nobody wanted really to go, but uh, ended up uh, being a, an option for many, many Jews. Um, I just want to add that Nora became an architect in Brazil and a swimming champion, and she's still, she's 98, and she still swims and, and coaches swimmers every day. So um, now we'll, uh, we, uh, we'll ask this time uh, Dita Rosanna Parente, the alleged, uh, to, to read uh, Nora's uh, uh, memoir. Thank you. Son Fiuman e Menevanto. They used to say back in my homeland, or rather, in my former land that today is Rieka and belongs to Croatia, but that in my childhood belonged to Italy and was called Fiume. Son Fiuman e Menevanto means I am from Fiume and I boast about it. I don't know exactly why I should be proud of the city I was born in, or for that matter, why anyone should be proud of their hometown, since this is nothing more than a biogeographical accident. Anyway, it needs to be said that for a small town, approximately 60,000 inhabitants at the time, Fiume was quite impressive. It had the atmosphere and infrastructure of a metropolis, sumptuous buildings like the palace of the former Hungarian governors, Casa Pancera, where I lived where I, when I was six, seven years old, Palazzo Andrea, etc. It also had interesting churches and most importantly, a beautiful theater, the Teatro Verdi, built by the architect who made the Vienna Opera House. The school buildings were large with well-equipped gymnasiums, like I haven't seen any here in Rio. On the other hand, the teachers were for the most part terrible and the population rather provincial. Despite this, cultural life was intense, promoted in the first place by a very active Società Concerti, Society of Concerts. There was no famous musician of the time who had not performed in our theater. The opera season was also quite popular. In the crowded galleries, work workers of all kinds wearing their overalls, sheet music in their hands, followed the performances and made surprisingly appropriate judgments. Then there was Circolo, dedicated to literary activities, and the Cita Onica. I can guarantee the spelling. <laughs> that served the same functions, but for Croatian families. These two institutions did not really see eye to eye as the Italo files hated the Croato files and vice versa. In the middle of the Corso, Viale Vittorio Emanuele III, rose the Civic Tower, on top of which a double-headed eagle, symbol of the Austro-Hungarian sovereignty, once reigned. The fascists broke one of its heads, and the eagle became that symbol of the fascist party known to all. But in place of the other head remained the rebar that once supported it. In the Torre Civica, there was naturally a clock, and at the base of the arch, similar to our Arcos de Teles, through which you reach the old city, Citta Vecha, which with medieval buildings, narrow and smelly alleys, everything smelled of mold and misery. My father, Eduardo Taus, was born in Piazza Miller, which despite or because of his age, was a very romantic place, full of century-old trees. Also noteworthy was Piazza San Marco, which extended on the deck, on the edge of which there was a very high pedestal topped with the Lion of San Marco, symbol of the domination of the Serenissima Repubblica di Venezia. From this, you can infer that Fiume was a poor city, that in fact, it was successively dominated by several European powers, to the point that deep down, no Fiumano knows exactly who he belongs to, to whom he owes patriotic love or loyalty. It is said that during the war, there was a group of friends drinking in a bar. There was a lack of food, but wine was still available in the osterias. Suddenly, an excited man enters shouting, Vincemo, Vincemo! That is, we win, we win. Chi? 
Who? Someone asked. Noi. We? Some comes the answer. Ma chi siamo noi? But who are we? Asked the audience. Whoever told this story was present, and there is no reason to doubt this story because it is so characteristic of our people. For that reason, it's no wonder that Fumus' coat of arms bore an eagle, always the unfailing bird holding a cornucopia underneath, which was written in the Fisinter, let's say inexhaustible, signaling that the loyalty of the Fumans was inexhaustible. I just don't know in relation to whom. But on the other hand, doesn't our gold and green flag include order and progress? Hence, it follows that everyone adopts symbols and phrases of what they would like the most and cannot achieve. Returning to Fiume, there was also Piazza Regina Elena, from where, during the winter, buses and trucks departed to take skiers, including my mother and my brother, Giorgio, to the mountains. In this, we were very lucky. Our city stretched along a very narrow strip between the sea and the mountains, so that in the summer we had fun on the various beaches, while in the winter we went skiing in a place called Conca Guidorei on Monte Nevoso, where there was a very warm shelter, Rifugio Guidorei, and where they served the best tea with lemon I have ever tasted in my life. When we didn't have money to pay for the trip, even by truck, cheaper than the bus, we stayed in the city. Then we went up to Val Scurigne, from where we could go down on a sled. For those who looked at the city from the sea, to the right there was a river, the Recina. The border between Italy and Yugoslavia ran along this river. There was a bridge that led to a small town on the other side, Susak. This was much smaller and simpler than Fiume and is now part of Rijeka. In Susak, there was a small chapel on the bank of the Recina. On the altar, Saint Nepomuk, patron saint of Susak, with open arms like Christ the Redeemer. The border passed exactly through the arms of the saint. As Fiume was a free zone for many years, smuggling was free across this bridge. Even this writer, who is recounting this story, smuggled innumerable bags of coffee and many letters that had to be sent in Yugoslavia, avoiding fascist censorship. I did it with the greatest ease and face, because the residents on both sides didn't need a passport or a visa, just a tessera di frontiera, and we children, up to 12 years old, didn't even need that. I only gave up this merit meritorious activity when already approaching 17 years old, the guard asked me how old I was, to which I replied, almost 12 years old. <laughs> then he told mom to get me a tessera. I felt at this point that it was good to stop, and my mother thought that too. Mama, who was called Yolanda Kapolnai before getting married, had a very cheerful and strong temperament. She communicated vitality in her ways and body language. She was a lot like my daughter, Laura, who is undoubtedly a mix of mostly Kapolnai with a dash of Ronai. Well, now that you already know that dad was Eduardo and mom Yolanda, it's time to tell you about their marriage, because of which I've been here since a cold winter morning on February 29th, 1924. My nonna, Rosa Weitz, dad's mother, married a widower, Philip Taus, who already had two children, Samuel, the eldest, and Ernesto, the youngest. Shortly after, he had a, she, she had a girl, Olga. This girl, who, however, tragically died of asphyxiation when the wet nurse rolled over her as she fell asleep. Two years later, my father was born. When little Eduardo was four years old, he lost his father as his grandfather, Philippe, died of tuberculosis. His half-brother, Samuel, 18 years his senior, took charge of running the wholesale wine import firm, which at the time was completely bankrupt due to its owner's long illness. Moreover, his other half-brother, Ernesto, was already ill, having been infected with tuberculosis. My nonna, poor thing, was left without a piece of furniture in the house, because during her husband's illness, she had to sell everything to pay for the doctor and the medicines. There wasn't even money for the burial. Who ended up paying for everything was the Freemason Lodge of Fiume, 
And my grandfather was not even a Freemason. Mama was born in the Hungarian town of Najikanisa, but was taken to Fiume as a baby, three months old. Her mother, we called her Omi, curiously had the same name as her nonna, Rosa Weiss, but the two were not even remotely related. Omi has married a serial wholesaler named Con Laios, Luis Con, who later had to name his, grand his children couple Nai when the Hungarian government ordered that foreign names be Hungarianized. Mom had four siblings, Aunt Valeria, Aunt Elvira, Uncle Ladislao, and Uncle Americo. In Hungarian, Vali, Ella, Laci, and Imre. Aunt Valeria was the oldest, and then came the others in descending order of age, with Mama, Yolani in Hungarian, being the penultimate before Uncle Americo. My father was very friendly with Uncle Ladislao, with whom he, he practiced fencing almost every day. The goal of the two was to cut off the buttons of the other's clothes. At the end of the big fights, they, there they were both with a, with a button on their clothes. Then mom would come and sew everything back together. She sawed and sawed so much that dad and her fell in love with each other. This, however, was reckless and a bad idea at the time, since good sons and daughters usually waited for the orders of the family who, in accordance with political and financial interests, contracted marriages. Young people didn't have a say. In fact, in many cases, they didn't even know each other. Uncle Samuel wanted Papa, a very handsome young man, to marry a rich girl whose wedding dowry would improve the working capital of the firm Fratelli Taus. And this was no wild dream, as many wealthy families would have gladly taken the deal. Dad was not only handsome, but also intelligent, finely educated, good character, and belonged to a family that used to be illustrious, meaning wealthy. Grandpa Louis, on the other hand, wanted mom to marry a wealthy boy, who by becoming a partner in the cereal trading firm would increase his firm's working capital. This was not without foundation either, for mother was beautiful, even if somewhat, somewhat thin by the canons of the time. But on the other hand, she was educated and hardworking, trilingual correspondent for the Faginea Timber Company. Mom was also a lot of fun. She sang and danced well, had a sense of humor, and was an excellent tennis player. Hence, the two families became extremely angry and never forgave the two ungrateful, who dared to marry each other without any regard for traditions and commercial conveniences. It also goes from there that both families looked at us grandchildren, Giorgio and I, as offspring of the other's dream spoiler. Our situation was quite uncomfortable, wasn't it? What saved us was that at least the four of us, dad, mom, Giorgio, and I, were close, and we loved each other very much. Of course, sometimes we fought, we fought, but it was things without depth or importance. It would pass in a few minutes, and then we would go back to playing as usual. Between Fiume and Budapest. Long before that, still in Budapest, when the political situation in Europe started to look murky and threatening, my parents predicted that eventually we will be forced to emigrate. And out there, what are we going to live on? They asked themselves. So they decided to learn practical trades. Dad, an excellent amateur photographer, took a course at the studio of his friend Halmi to refresh his skills. Hami was the fashion photographer sought after by almost all VIPs in Hungary and the surrounding areas. Mom went to take a, a, a seamstress course to make bras, girdles, and garters. Her dermatologist even gave her all her prescriptions for creams and lotions so that she could use them out there if necessary. This was very nice of Dr. Tertoski, because in general, these doctors keep the secrets of their formulas under lock and key. The day after dad was fired from the insurance company, we let everyone in town know that mom took orders for girdles and bras and that dad had a photography studio at home, which perfectly executed photos for documents and also photographed weddings, christenings, etc. Giorgio started to work as a seller for articles for dentists and prosthetics, and I started selling silk stockings. There was no nylon at that time. 
so scarves and corsets that I received on commission from a Jewish merchant, owner of a beautiful shop on Corso Vittorio Emanuele III. Unfortunately, I don't remember his name. I would put all these things in a suitcase and go door to door to sell them. Giorgio traveled all around Italy selling his merchandise, but his headquarters were in Bologna, where he got supplies and from where he left for his travels. In addition, mother taught me how to finish the bras she sewed, and when she had a lot of work to do, which luckily happened often, as I mentioned, I would take the bras to Aunt Valeria's house, who lived across the street and at the sewing machine. She beautifully did the finishing. So we managed to push life with our belly, while we frantically tried to get visas to enter some country, out there, any country that would take pity on us and let us enter. But nobody wanted us. To go to the United States, for example, a citizen there had to provide an affidavit, if I remember the spelling correctly, in which he committed to, support the, to supporting the immigrant if he, do, if he did not find work. We would need four affidavits. There were Americans who sold these documents, but we didn't have enough money to pay them. Visa. Ketzlai Lenke, Dad's secretary, had emigrated to the United States and married an Irishman named Denner, who was the president of American Express Co. Lenke offered us two affidavits. Dad and Mom wanted me and Georgia to go, so that at least two of us would be safe. But there was no way George and I would leave our parents behind to face certain death. I wrote a letter in English to the future Queen Elizabeth, who is about my age. I explained our situation and begged her to let us into England, that we would be forever grateful, industrious, disciplined, and useful subjects. I sent Suzak's letter, as from Italy it would be censored by the Italian government. Then Dad went to Suzak and obtained a New York phone book. He searched and found eight people named Taos. Of course, all Taos in the world are related. Based on this, he wrote to all eight and included the international stamp of reply in the letters. He explained our situation to them, said that we were all healthy and with tremendous determination to work, that we were never going to cost them a penny, that we already had two affidavits and that we only needed two more. Well, we didn't get any response, which just demonstrates that they were real Taos and relatives. <laughs> Going back to our attempts to get a visa to emigrate, we tried Australia, Argentina, to no avail. We were just in the hustle and bustle when one night, or rather early morning, in the bell rang. There were half a dozen or more soldiers with bayonets on top of their rifles, revolvers in their hands. They came to arrest Papa and Giorgio to take them to a concentration camp. Dad could only take with him the clothes on his back and a blanket. They wanted to take Giorgio too, but then Mom started asking, for the love of God, do not take him. Because he was a child after all. He had not turned 18 yet. Then they left, taking Dad. Having decided to escape, we packed Georgia's suitcase, and after saying goodbye to mom, we went downstairs with me, and we headed to the railway station, located right in front of our house. We stopped at the entrance to the hall, because we noticed that it was full of soldiers and police. We wanted to get out, but the two policemen at the door had stopped Georgia and asked him for his ID, which naturally gave him away, but the word Hebreo, Jew, printed on it. They took Georgia and put him in a truck, parked a little further on, and in which there were already other people. I just stood around watching the truck. Shortly after, the truck departed. I started to run after. I run and run a lot until he took the climb to Torretta. Even on the way up, I still covered a good stretch. But then I could not run anymore and lost sight of it, at least. We now knew that the prisoners were taken to the Torretta school. Thank you, Elite. And we'll now connect uh, um, with Nora Taos from Rio de Janeiro. Nora um, asked me to speak in Portuguese. 
Uh, she has not spoken Italian since 1938, and she won't start now. <laughs> Olá, oi, Nora, boa noite, tudo bem? Tudo bem. Que bom tudo bem. Ver. If you, if you, if it is better to you, I can try to speak English also. <laughs> if you like, if you not like, we'll see. If you... As you prefer. <laughs> Se você prefere português, a gente faz um pouco de tradução, se não, inglês é ótimo, tá? Ok. Se me faltar alguma palavra, eu pergunto, não? Thank you very much. So, Nora, some days ago... Yes. Oh, sorry. Here I don't... Now. Ok. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. No, yes. Me pode ver? Me vê, Di? Você pode me ver? Tá me não, 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 não te vejo, não. Não vejo ah, niente. Casa italiana. Ah, o uh, ponto. Agora você. Ah, de... ah que bom, que bom. <risos> so, um, um, one small question to start. If we had dinner and you told me about when you were studying to become a pianist. Yes. And then you said that suddenly you got very upset that you had not done it, you had not been able to continue. But then you said something else about what makes us happy. Would you like to, to tell us a little bit about those things that you left in Fiume and that could not be done? Que não foi possível fazer e depois você... I left my whole life. I, li I left my whole life, my piano, uh, my uh, uh, preferred books, uh, I, can't, I can't, we left everything, everything. We couldn't uh, uh, take with us uh, very much things, no? We only took uh, the absolute necessity, to one or two uh, dresses and uh, uh, sweaters or something like this. Huh? And then you didn't start playing piano, again, although you have musician's daughter, but you didn't start playing piano again, but you did something else. Yeah, I saw when I, I arrived here, I saw in the newspapers uh, announcements. 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 Yeah. Announcements that uh, 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 professor of piano with a, a diploma of uh, uh, this from the university here gives uh, lessons for five. Um, Cinco, cinco mil reis. I don't know what would be the, 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 the what would be the valor, the, the value of five thousand mil reis. But it was very, very, Expensive. very little. Something very little. Then I thought I. I should uh, rent a piano that would be not very good because I rent a piano, you must imagine. And I should learn a lot more and then I would not be able to help my family because I wouldn't uh, earn anything. So I decided to forget the piano and never more think about it. And that I did. In this uh, item, I am good. If I decide to forget anything, I forget it for good. <laughs> But also you remember the lot in your book. Hmm? 
No, no, can you tell us, we ask this to all the people who have uh, all this memoir, the, the authors of these memoirs, can you tell us a little bit about what drove you to write the memoir and what you would like to tell younger people today? I have, I have, I have grandchildren and I didn't want them to, to uh, ignore completely uh, what happened in Europe. And so I write, I wrote my memories for them. I never uh, thought that my book would uh, be published. Be, uh, published. But Laura is very uh, uh, how could I say very decided determined and she uh, got and, and uh, found an editor and she edited uh, my memories that I wrote with a pen for my only for my grandchildren, and I never thought it would be edited, but it... Mas você é convidada em muitos lugares para apresentar o livro, apresentar a, a história da sua vida. Eu, eu queria saber o que você queria dizer às pessoas, às jovens, às estudantes, às pessoas das gerações novas. Olha. No, everybody that sees, sees uh, that um, speaks to me, I can see that I am a very, very, very old lady. And then people think, ah, this very, very old lady must have very much uh, experience of life. And so maybe she could give good uh, um, advice, advice uh, to the youngsters. But uh, I couldn't give good advice, even not to me, for, for myself. I, I, I don't know. I, maybe if I could live 500 years, maybe I would learn about life. But multimedia, we do contact. I frequently. I, I see that I, I didn't learn very much uh, during this uh, quite almost 100 years. You know that uh, in this month, in the end of this month, I will be 99 years old. Oh. <laughs> And we have a friend here in the in the hall, Stella Levy, who is just a year ahead of you. <laughs> yes, I know. Uh, I'm swimming. And I'm espero que você vai encontrá-la. Ah, tem uma nossa amiga aqui, o nome dela é Stella Levy. Ela também escreveu a memória dela. E ela é um pouco mais 99 agora. É meio. É meio. Eu, vou fazer, eu vou fazer 99 agora, em Ótimo. fevereiro. Então vocês vão se encontrar para conversar, que pode ser que 99 cada uma, e vocês vão achar algo, uma receita para o mundo. <risos> Isso é minha boa, mas. Where this, this lady? Ela é aqui na, sentada aqui na nossa frente. Quer, ah, quer é, que te apresente? Então, um beijo, um beijo meu para ela. É, é demais subir no, no palco. Nora, e tem algo que você queria falar para o nosso público aqui? Eu... eu... Eu, eu queria desejar a todos eles uh, muita, muita sorte, que grande parte do, uh, do que alcançamos na vida depende também de sorte. 
nossa de boa vontade, de capacidade de trabalho, uma sorte também, desejo a eles e, e me comove é, a intenção de guardar a memória dessa grande vergonha da humanidade que foi o Holocausto. Realmente não deve ser esquecido. A Nora said that she's moved by the fact that uh, we all continue to look at this uh, shame of history that is the Holocaust and that she wishes everyone a lot of luck because although it's important to work hard and be good and do things in life, be determined and, and, and try to do our best, luck plays a very big role in, in life. Yes. Muito obrigada, Nora. Obrigada. <laughs> E a Estela vai te visitar no Rio, assim que vocês podem se encontrar. Tá bom? Ah, essa senhora que tem a minha idade. Exatamente, que é aqui no meio, no, na primeira fila, que está dizendo alô. E não dá para me mostrar ela, ou me mostrar a ela? Você está vindo o, o público também? Eu vi o... Eu vou ficar vendo a Natália só. Agora estamos vendo só você. Mas eu já vi várias vezes o público, assim. Né? A próxima vez. Tá bom. Obrigada, Nora. Tchau, tchau. Tchau. E aqui é o nosso último reading. Um, It's a memoir that was given to Centro Primo Levi by Kathy Lager, uh, has not been published and we will publish it this year. Uh, Kathy was born in 1920 in Fiume to Austro-Hungarian parents, was a very, very large family um, that uh, had settled in Fiume somehow um, f because the head of the family was a baker and he baked for the tr railways company. And he followed the construction of the tracks until he got to Fiume and he liked it. He thought he would go to America, but he liked it and he stayed there. Um, so Martino Lager and uh, Matilde Goldstein uh, married in Fiume. They had um, two children, Kathy and Andrew, Andrea, uh, also called Bambi, and whose daughter is here today. Um, she also wanted to be a pianist and a dancer. They also lived between Budapest, Vienna. Uh, it was a family that had multi multiple uh, location of life um, until the racial laws were promulgated and the, everybody's life was shattered. Uh, Matilde was a, a woman who was not a, uh, had not had a lot of education, but was very well read and was very in. Uh, tuned into politics, and he understood that the family had to leave. But this was impossible because it was a huge family. So together with an aunt that had come to the United States, Berta, they decide that all the young kids will, go, will come to New York. And they find a way. Berta was, worked uh, also as a seamstress in the Bronx, and they um, they worked very hard that they got the money for the affidavit and they brought all the young generation to, um, to live with her in this small apartment in the Bronx. We actually found a photograph of the kitchen with everybody um, gathered there. Um, Kathy, everybody found a job. Andy and Bandy, the two, uh, two cousins, um, were immediately drafted to Italy and uh, uh, went to fight in the liberation where Andy was killed. Uh, after the war, Kathy, Kathy got married in, uh, in New York and had a daughter, Marsha, whom we'll connect to later. Uh, she was born here and right after the war, um, Kathy decided to go back to Italy where she was reunited with part of the family that had survived in Bari. Bari was a city with very large DP camps, and this was the reason why um, many members of the family were there. 
and they decided to stay. And uh, the Lager family became, there was no Jewish community in Bari, and in the years following the war, they became kind of the Jewish community. The holidays and the uh, rituals and everything that pertained um, to Jewish life was propelled from uh, the Lager household in Bari. Um, and following that, they, they moved to Rome, where Kati decided to use her experience as a refugee of a refugee to help other people. And she worked her entire life for um, Hayas, for the, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. And Marsha began as a teenager to work for Hayas as well. She became a social worker and then a physician. So I've asked Alessandro Cassin to help us read uh, Cathy's words. Thank you very much. Good evening. Before, I cannot reach further back than my grandparents. And truly, I know very little about them. I never met my maternal grandparents, Joseph and Fanny Goldstein. They lived in Transylvania. Joseph had been a poor orphan who had become a religious tutor. He was well versed in Jewish learning and spoke Hungarian and German. When he married Fanny, he was 25, she barely 15. My mother was the youngest of the daughters and with her youngest brother, Arthur, fled to Budapest. The other siblings were either already married or drafted in the army of the empire. My paternal grandfather, Mark Lager, a handsome, tall, prophet-like figure, was a baker, married to Sara, who, who I remember as an old, shriveled-up woman who had given birth to 13 children, nine of whom survived. They had been married in one of the towns of Polish Galicia. Mark was baking bread for a team of railroad workers who were building a railway line from, that went from Poland through Hungary, Romania, and Austria, finally reaching Yugoslavia. I call these countries by their name, though in the years I'm talking about, they were all part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. As the railroad was making its way south, my Bubi and Zaide were going with it. Along this long and slow journey, their children were born in whichever place they happened to be at the moment. The Lager children started working when they were very small, helping their hardworking father. Only the last three ever went to school, but they all knew how to read because they went to Hebrew classes. They knew Hebrew and Yiddish, and of course picked up the language of the countries they successively moved through. The last five were born in Transylvania, where the railroad workers stopped for several years. The moon rose from behind the castle and mysteriously shone on all this beauty. The, sand, the sun went down behind Monte Maggiore, giving us the most wonderful light effects at sundown. Along the coastline by the sea, a long romantic walkway wound north for several miles. The narrow dark alley was lined with laurel bushes and the sea softly caressed the rocks Sur surfacing it. Far off, ten miles north, the lights of Fiume shone in the distance as a cloud of fireflies. Along the coastlines, a few miles north from each other were Voloska, Ichichi, Abazia, Laurana, Medea, Muschiena, lovely resorts which offered hospitality to the large number of tourists who drove down from the rich northern European countries and enjoyed the luxury nightlife of Abazia and the romantic and more modest little towns. Muschena was a typical fishing village. Its pastel-colored little homes lined up on the beach where the fishing boats had been dragged and long fishing nets were drying in the sun while their owners mended the holes ripped up during the night when they were at sea. At night, these boats seemed like star stars falling into the sea. Hanging from the bow was a big petroleum lamp to attract 
attract and trap the fish. These boats were called lampare. Medea was one of the smallest but maybe the prettiest pearl of the many pearls of the Gulf of Carnaro. Its wide bay opened its arm between the towers of an old castle on the one end and the pier where the ship that connected to Fiume docked several times a day. Not many people in the 30s in Italy owned cars, and the ship was the public transportation for the outings of families. On weekdays, the boat was lit up in the evening, and the passengers could dance on the board. The sea was very deep and very salty. The wide beach was covered with oval stones, as large as ostrich eggs, shiny and white. Our feet were sore until we got used to practically walking on eggs. By the end of the season, our soles had become hardened and less painful. The road behind the pebble beach ser serviced the privileged car owners and tourists and the bicycles of the local population. Two restaurants facing each other, one directly on the beach, the other across the road. Besides these two buildings, was the only, there was only one small villa, and this was the one that we had been renting for years, from 1934 to 1938. We, we just had to cross the road and we were ready at the beach, ready to walk into the water and start swimming. Or we could go to one of the small wooden piers and dive directly into the sea. After the famous September 1938, it was as if all of a sudden we had lost our roots. We no longer belonged. The law was ordering people to avoid the Jews, and they did. Naturally, I no longer attended public entertainment places to avoid humiliation. The Italian officers who had come to Jewish community centers for the Saturday evening dance suddenly disappeared. We realized that we were isolated. The circle of friends became smaller, but more compact. It was in the summer that Miki and his friend Vico started coming to visit us in Laurana. They were both working as traveling salesmen. I don't remember what they were selling. Miki had lost his job in Rome in the Department of Popular Culture, branch of cinematography. The two boys, about five years older than we were, sent us several postcards daily from their trips and by telegram would signal their visit as they were back. There was a special slang we used among us. Among us. We were all Jewish and multilingual and used, to, and used words from each language that best expressed what we wanted to say. Vico fell in love with Nerina, who had in the meantime blossomed into a beautiful young girl. She was pleased, but was too immature to return his love. Miki and I fell in love. Nevis, who was little, a little over 13 years old, loved our company and always stayed with us. Along the stairways going towards the sea, every two steps there was another couple. Lachi was with Paola, Miki, Nevis, and I were in the same step. Magda was with Federico, and Irina was with Vico. Their parents were seat, seated on easy chairs at the border of the garden. Uncle Benny, a real sadist, once in a while would light a match to spy on the couples. <laughs> we passed very romantic evening on the stairway. Nevis was like a chaperone, but truly I didn't need one because I was very shy and immature in love affairs and in voicing my feelings. However, there was a strong feeling between me and Miki we were missing each other very much when we were separated for days because of his work. My family was not pleased with this budding love and in a certain way tried to hamper this rapport that was clearly in indicating a latent and purely platonic love. My father was jealous of me and tried to object to our meetings but did not succeed in interrupting it. Vico and Miki had no relatives in the U.S and were planning to go to Palestine. The interest in Zionism that I had discovered years before in Romania started to spread and prevail among us too. But my mother was firmly against Israel, the Israel plan 
because immigration there was possible but illegal. The legal quota was almost non-existent. We girls were torn between the two countries. At the end of the summer, we had a goodbye party in the garden of Villa Paola. The two boys brought two cakes. On one they wrote America, on the other Israel. We only ate of the latter. It was a party full of sadness. The six of us, future immigrants, were there with our youth full of love and fear. My father drank and became tipsy. He was dancing with our guest and with mother. I felt my emotions rising like a fever and hid in a cave near the water breaking into a hysterical crying fit. Departure. Magda and Andrew left for Trieste two weeks before us. Bandi and I went to Naples to pick up our American visas. The affidavit had arrived and the visas were ready. Our luck, our luck at the time was that there was no immigrants from immigrations from Italy, and Italy and the Italian quota was at our disposal. Normally the Italian quota had been filled and waiting time ran into years. But with Mussolini's fighting his colonial wars, no Italian was permitted to emigrate. Having lost our citizenship, we had no passports on which to put the visa. Only the tears of my mother's mellowed at the tender nature of a VAP at the Department of State, who gave us a one-way Italian passport. Magna and Andrew miraculously obtained a Nansen, stateless passport and Irina and Nevis, who followed us in March 1940, were given a Hungarian passport by their father's friend, who was the Hungarian honorary consul in Fiume. This can give you an idea of the acrobatics that go into getting out of a situation of this sort. Bandi and I left on the 2nd of October. We arrived only one week after Magda and Andrew because their boat was smaller and the journey took double time. The Rex was bigger and more modern and made the trip in eight days. When we left Fiume, we took a train and our parents, our grandparents, Aunt Lanke with her babies and other friends took us to the train. Our parents did not want to accompany us to the boat. Their hearts were broken. On the Rex, we were traveling in third class cabin and met several people. We were looking with envy at the second class where there was dancing and other social activities in the more elegant quarters, which we could not afford. As for money, Italy only permitted $50 per person to be taken out of a country. Among the new acquaintance, there was a young American of Greek origin who had been in Greece on vacation and was going back to work as a bartender in a 7th or 8th Avenue ice cream parlor. This young, young man by the name of Steve kept in contact with us for several years. I often stopped at his ice cream parlor to satisfy my craving for ice cream. Bandi, who wanted to be very protective of me and who also wanted to show off, had told Steve that he was older than I, so that if I was 18, he had to be at least 20. Steve made believe that he was fooled, but when Bandi later confessed his true age, he laughingly said, I knew you were lying. Your face never saw a razor. Besides Steve and I met a young German Jewish refugee whom I saw several times later, but I did, not, I did not like him because he had a very strong German accent. I always hated the German language, but after I listened to the raving speeches of Hitler on the radio, this language became even more hateful to me. America. When the boat landed and we disembarked on October 9, 1939, we stopped at the baggage claim area of the port of New York. The landing space was divided into zones, indicated with letters of the alphabet, so that the luggage could come to the sector that was indicated by the initial of the passenger. There, under the letter L, we had been waiting our luggage to come out of a hold and then we had to go through customs. The people who were waiting for us were in another part of a pier and could not enter the area we were in, nor could they recognize us at such a distance. 
There were lots of people waiting. Finally, we spotted Magda and Andrew and Bertha. They were waiting for us on the other side of a custom section, and they had been waiting until late afternoon. They finally embraced us, and we made our way to the Bronx. Aunt Bertha had married a German refugee. She had met Uncle Morris in Fiume at the time of my grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary in 1937. Morris had three ch children. Ruth and Max had stayed on in Fiume at my grandparents' home and had come to America just a few weeks prior to our arrival. The third son, Herman, was in Israel and joined the fam family several months later in 1940. So here we were, six teenagers, six teenagers and a middle-aged couple in a four-room apartment with two bedrooms, one bath, a kitchen, and a living room. We had to eat in turns because there was no dining room and the kitchen was small. Magna, Andy, Bandy, and I slept in one room. The boys each had a normal bed, while Magda and I slept on a metal cot which could be folded to make room during the day. Max slept on a cot in an L-shaped narrow corridor. Ruth was sleeping in the living room, and the master bedroom, of course, belonged to Aunt Bertha and Morris. In these cramped quarters, we had to be on strict schedule for our hygienic needs, and the time limits was binding, as we all had to leave the house before 8 a.m. The generosity of Aunt Bertha in opening her home to us cannot be exalted enough. She was a hard-working woman, laboring in a sweatshop in the garment section downtown, being paid by the piece. Coming out of a subway, which in the, Bronx, in the Bronx became elevated, she did the shopping for us, famished youngsters, and embracing the two huge bags with her tired arms, she walked up the hill on Mount Eden Avenue to continue her stressful day by cooking for all of us. But there was warmth of being together, of facing this huge unknown country in a family group, which was still very close. Thank you, Alessandro. And now we connect with Marcia Fink, Kathy's daughter, who was born here. Ciao, Marcia. How are you? Hi. Hi. Okay. Thank you. The whole thing was very moving. Thank you. And uh, I'm very glad that we pulled from the archive uh, this memoir that your mother gave us so many years ago and uh, that we, are, we publish it. Marsha, would you like to say a few things about what uh, this whole, ex I mean, you are really part of this experience. Okay. In, in I will repeat part of what you said. The main figure in, the, in this whole history is probably my grandmother, Tilda. My great grandparents on my grandfather's side had come and established themselves in Fiume at the end of World War I. And they already had children and families, but the family was very close. They were uh, strongly uh, Orthodox. The family less, but maintained a very strong Jewish tradition that my grandfather and grandmother later transmitted to, to me in particular. Um, we had members of our family who died at the, at the hands of the Germans. Uh, the great-grandparents the great and their daughter, Lenke, whom we don't know whether, if they went to the camps or if they were killed locally. And another cousin on my grandmother's side who uh, was in the, in, uh, in the camps working in the crematoriums and uh, later participated in the founding of Israel by furnishing arms through Italy to the future Israelis and then immigrating to Israel. Um, my mother got married. My mother and the other cousins survived the horrors of Nazism because my grandmother actually got them 
and convinced the other parents to send them away. She knew what was going on. She had a sense of the horrible history which was coming and wanted at least the young people to be a way to, uh, to save their lives. And she succeeded in that. It was a very knit group, the one of the cousin, and this was transmitted also to the, to the younger generation. We're still in touch with each other. Yeah, if for years I, I've been following, I've been in touch with everybody. This yes. Is a huge family or in many different in places. many different countries, France, and the United States, um, Switzerland, Italy, and who knows where else. But anyway, I, I was so influenced that my, even though I'm not an Orthodox Jew, Judaism represent part of my identity. I am who I am because I'm Jewish. And this was instilled in me by my grandmother. Those were the years when Israel was being founded. When Israel was, I, I was two years old when Israel was founded. And we were following all the news on the radio with great anxiety. My grandmother had a great, had a big family in Israel. And as I said, in some ways, we only lost a few people to the, to the, to Nazis because God protected the rest of the family and they lived either in the United States or Israel. My mother started to, after she got married the second time in Italy, had two other children. And for many years, she was a mother, but she started to work when I was 16 years old for the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, Hayas, um, in Rome, where we had moved from the South. I sort of followed suit because they needed some help here and there. And I started still, while still in high school, to work for Hyas. And after I finished high school, while still going to university, I worked as a, I sort of made myself my way up and worked in the Rome, Paris, and New York offices of Hyas. And then again, when I went to med when I decided to go to medical school after social work school, I worked in Hyas with the, with the Russian refugees. I have seen refugees who told me their histories and their suffering um, from Romania, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary. Um, and I myself worked with the, those refugees from the 67 war that came from Egypt and other uh, Middle Eastern company because I spoke French and from Israel where I was immediately after the 67 war I had gone to Paris to work on uh, to work with the families of those refugees from especially from Egypt because the men had been put in concentration camps over there and I had a special project with another person in Geneva to try to liberate them and bring them outside whether it be wherever they wanted to go. Thank you, Marsha. Would you like to say a word of, about what this memory is for us today? And this memory, I mean, I am, um, I think that this memory is something that should always survive and that I hope never repeats itself. Unfortunately, we're not in an easy world these days, but we should try to remember what happened and how many people died in order to avoid it again and accept each other for what we are. I think that the lady from Brazil said it, we should accept each other for who we are, regardless of skin, color, religion, or anything else. Thank you, Marcia. Thank you very much. I want to say, Stila, I, I don't know if you know, but I may be the last person who got her American citizenship through your mom. <laughs> and thank you very much, Marsha. And I hope that we'll see you here soon. And Sandra, too, your sister. 
and when the book will be ready. And, and thank you so much for organizing this event. I you think know that, that Lisa is it is here. is here in the what, audience. Whoever organized it, it is wonderful, and it is in the alma mater because I graduated from Edinburgh University with my bachelor. Thank you very much, Marsha. So I just want to thank everybody for being here. Thanks Stefano and the, the Consulate of Italy that has been a, a real uh, support system this year. Um, I want to say a few words about what, what these stories mean. I mean, we have such a big amount of these personal voices and of course not all of them can be read or published or uh, made accessible. But it is so important to see the lives of, of families, of, of mothers or daughters and fathers and uh, uh, siblings, people who live together and suddenly have to pack and go. And this is happening every day today in many, many parts of the world. Um, it has hap been happening for the past 50 years after uh, the end of the war, um, of the Second World War, where increasingly the issues re of refugees has uh, only grown in uh, as our knowledge and our capacity to have societies with democracies, with justice, with services um, on one side grew, but on the other end, as an Arendt uh, foresaw very clearly in Primo Levi too, um, refugees, people who have no ground, who have no rights, who have no, who have no safety net, are um, growing in number in our, in our world every day. And so we do this also to made it, make it different or try to change the culture that uh, uh, creates this division, separation of inclusion and exclusion. Uh, in our society, in our society that can make the difference. And thank you very much.